The Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce runs a popular public lecture programme exploring contemporary issues. Teachers TV has access to these lectures and today we bring you a lunchtime talk by Emma Thompson and Helen Bamber on the subject of sex slavery and human trafficking. The Helen Bamber Foundation has pioneered work in the area of human rights and their public installation, called Journey, highlights the stages of suffering experienced by sex slaves who've been trafficked into this country. This afternoon, they discuss the installation and the issues it raises. Yeah. Well, I think because we don't have very much time and we have an awful lot to discuss here, um, I'd like to start just by describing um, how Journey came about. Can I ask you, if you don't mind being feeling like mm -hmm. you're in a schoolroom, if anyone has actually seen the installation? Oh, so a few of you, okay. Um, well, I, but I would like to explain how it came about because it's sort of at the, at the root of our relationship in a way. Um, so when Helen, who I've known for over 20 years and who has taught me a great deal about human rights, about the nature of suffering, about the complexity of suffering, um, I've, I've worked with her for a long time and we've, we've talked about everything and I feel as though she's been my mentor for a long time on this subject um, and when she said she was going to start a new foundation um, I said well I'll, I'll help I'd like to help and um, I didn't quite know in what capacity I would help but um, I started to again converse this is all, all good things I think are as, as a result of long-term conversations you know and I started to converse with Helen and with Michael Korzynski her her director partner um, in the organization about the clients and about the journeys that they'd been through and I started to think about how um, how important their stories were basically Helen said to me something very interesting about the foundation she said we are dealing with the most unattractive of people to society this is these our clients are not attractive to people they are people who have suffered so intensely and been so damaged that in a sense mm. their voices are stifled not just once by their suffering but twice when they come into society and no one wants to hear their stories because they're too dreadful to contemplate. I don't think that that's because we're mean or we're, we're, we're cruel about, uh, about people suffering. Uh, what I think it is is that those of us who have an energy and a resonance with other human beings find it very difficult find it very painful to hear these stories. Now, for a long time, I've been wondering how we can tell stories about, about the outsider, yes. about people who, who, who find it very, very difficult to reintegrate into society. And I started to talk to the clients. And Helen will talk later, I think, about the methods that she has used to help them to reach a point at which they can tell their stories without being overwhelmed by by physical pain and memories that they cannot cope with. Um, and one of the clients I met was a woman called Elena Varga who had been trafficked. And she told her story in such a way that it stuck with me and stuck with me. And I, I thought, how can I, bring, how can I make this into a story that's not a film? I can't watch films about trafficking or torture because I can't bear, to, I can't bear it. I can't do anything with the feelings that I get at the end of a movie. I think, well, what am I going to do about this? There is no, as it were, catharsis on offer because it's not fictional, it's real. And um, uh, so I thought, is there a way in which we can engage with these people in, in another way, in which we can tell the story in a more participatory way? Um, where we're not objectifying and therefore putting ourselves in a position of hearing something unbearable about which we can do nothing, but a story that we can feel as though is happening to a part of us, and so that we can, as it were, expose ourselves to those feelings of the outsiderness. It's, it's, been, it's been very interesting watching people go through the, the installation um, because they come out in a sort of state of shock, as though they have been somewhere that they yes. weren't expecting to go. We haven't explained to those who haven't seen it that there are seven containers. We haven't mm -hmm. said that. Well, I'll start with, 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 with Elena's. What I did was I said, we've got to do this in seven stages, because I was thinking of Shakespeare's Seven Ages of Man. I was thinking seven stages of the cross and all of that. 
So I made, I made two sets of matchboxes, which I covered with paper. And I gave one set to Elena, and I said, right, this is our homework for the week. We go away, and we, we put what we think should be in each container, what part of the journey that you've been on should be represented in each container. And what was so interesting about it was when we came back a week later for our next meeting, and this was a year ago, we'd both come up with the same names, almost, for those stages. And they are as follows. The first container, which was designed by Michael Howes, who's a film production designer, uh, has always been called Hopes and Dreams and Aspirations. Because Elena came from a tiny place in, in Moldova, eight houses, and she'd always wanted more than that, like so many women who come from poverty-stricken backgrounds where there is very little op opportunity. Um, and so that box was about that. It was about that kind of situation. Um, and Michael wanted to make it... It's, it, it's almost Dickensian, and it's, you look through a yes. keyhole and there are little scenes that you look at, and the scenes are from that kind of innocent wow. childhood that is very tough. Um, the next one is, was always called The Journey, The Motion, and it's dark, it's a soundscape. Each artist cur curated their own container according to what they wanted to, the way in which they wanted to to show the story. So we merely gave them the title, Hopes, Dreams and Aspirations, The Journey. So you go and you stand and there's a 10 minute soundscape that you listen to. The third one is about the uniform. And it was inspired by the fact that Elena told me when she arrived in, in, in Great Britain, she was given, before she started work in this frightful slave trade, a bag of old used thongs and basques and stuff that had been used before by other girls in order to put those on. So Sandy Powell, the costume designer, took this on. And you go into a mirrored hall and you look, you look through holes in the mirror and you see yourself reflected and you're standing above the body of a girl dressed in these clothes. So you, can, you are looking at yourself, as it were, in these clothes. It was one of the ways we decided not to objectify. Rather than looking at them, we are them. And then you come out and you go into container number four, which is um, truly, it's very disturbing to people. It's called the workplace. It's the bedroom. And it's, it represents the room where Elena was imprisoned for three weeks, weeping and begging and brutalised until she was broken down enough to say, well, there's, I've got no choice, I'm going to have to do this. And um, this was designed by a group called Quiet Storm, and they have made... Um, it's, it's like... Um, it, it's very literal. It is a facsimile of the bedroom, but they've used everything. They've used sound, they've used movement, they've used a, a bed that actually moves, and they've used smells and sensations, so it's quite a strong um, experience. And you come out into a rather, um, the next container, which is rather neutral in comparison, and it's called the customer. And it's about the punter, because one of the things we felt was most important to examine about this slave trade is the demand, because there's a huge demand here in London. We've got to look at that and say, well, what's all that about? And it's no good pointing the finger and saying, you bastards. You've got to say, who are you and why is this happening? Why is this what you want? So it's pictures by a photographer called Ewan Spencer of men, and it's testimonials taken from actual customers and punters and then reproduced by actors on an audio loop. Then the next box is Anish Kapoor's sculpture, which is a strange, um, sensational, again, sort of, he calls it um, performative, yes, yes, and it's a void. So you, if you stand in front of it, it seems to draw you into the darkness. And we'd given him the, the curatorship of the word stigma, and this is what he came up with. And you go around the other side, and the, uh, the structure comes out at you physically, it's a, it's a cone, as it were. And if you stand in the right place, it seems to just come towards you. It's a very powerful, very but powerful. entirely abstract experience. Mm. And then the last container is something that we called it's the language container, and it's the container that Mike, Mike and I um, were responsible for. And it's about the language of nullification and, and rejection. Um, it's about home office language. It contains home office guidelines, interview guidelines, which are actually not bad. And then underneath, there are little pieces from home office determinations, negative determinations, all related to trafficked women, who are in, which are in direct and ironic contradiction to the guidelines that 
that the interviewer has presumably been given. And then on the other side, there's Laura Carlin's drawings, beautiful cave, like cave paintings of, of women. And while you look at this, you listen to Elena's voice, um, which has been altered, obviously, to protect her identity, um, telling her story. It's a 15-minute audio. And what this was the most unexpected thing about the installation, which none of us knew. Well, none of us knew what it would be like until it, as it were, arrived. Um, was that I thought, having taken Elena's interview and cut it, that people would just listen to a little bit and then move on. Yeah. But what we didn't realise was the power of the story, her story and her telling of it is so strong that people stand there for 15 minutes and listen. And it's like being in a church because they're listening to an audience. So there's silence and yet you can just hear these tiny little tinny voices and then people come out and we jump on them <laughs> and say, come and sign the petition. And well, um, work out what they they wander toward us. Yes, they do. They That's do. Very true. They wander I, I toward us. Yes, and it's very interesting. Some of the things that they say. One man, um, and this says something about my own reaction, my own assumptions. I wouldn't have expected to hear it from him. It says something about me, actually. And that's what this whole exhibition, this whole installation is really about. It's about the other, but it's also about us. Mm. So I learned something very quickly then about my own quick and incorrect assumption. He came up to me and he said, you know, I can't help thinking that this could have happened to my sister or even to my mother. And he had tears in his eyes. And I don't know any more than that, but we talked for quite a long time about everything and nothing. He signed the petition, which is a petition to persuade the government by signatures to ratify the European Convention on Trafficking. And it's very interesting. Yesterday, I was with Emma. We were both at the, the little booth. It was very windy. So you're standing there really quite exposed. The wind blows, papers are flying. You have inadequate paper, right. whatever it is. And you're, you're managing chaos. And a school, a, a group of school kids came up, which, you know, had I been a, a child, I might have walked over the other side of the road you know, had I been, Absolutely. you know, alone. Mm. There was a group of kids, and they were absolutely incredible, weren't they? They talked, of course, they were thrilled to be speaking to Emma, but they spoke very openly, very easily. They were going to take it to their school, and they were going to try and put on a play. I've got a feeling you maybe asked the <laughs> <laughs> to do something, but because they did say that to me when you were out of hearing, <laughs> but, um, and I haven't mentioned it before now, but um, I did say you were rehearsing in the morning and you were very busy at the moment, but I think uh, they're quite determined. And there were boys, there were quite a few boys, and they all wanted to sign the petition and they wanted to go back to the school and do something about it. So. Um, of course you do meet some people who are in, in denial, of course you do, um, and who have adopted a kind of phraseology of denial about people wanting to come here to have a better life, etc., etc. Of course you do. But um, I must say, I, I've, been, I've been quite amazed at the comments of people. And the stillness, despite the, the, the fact that we're standing there in the wind and, and at one stage with the rain, but there's also a stillness as people can't quite articulate what they want to say but are wanting to communicate. So it's a very extraordinary experience to be in this little booth in Trafalgar Square and to communicate in the way that people need. I think in some ways uh, the idea 
of trying to share something rather than impose something is what it's all about. And um, I don't know if we could do that on other issues as well, but there it is. It's, it's extraordinary, quite extraordinary. I think that there's an awful lot that we can extrapolate um, here because there's many different areas that we can discuss and I would like you to guide us. You could just tell us what you would like us to address. That would be great. Could you put it in context in relation to the buying and selling of sex? Yes. Um, I guess you're talking about the, uh, the Venn diagram overlap it has with prostitution. One of the things that we've had to make very, very clear is this is, not, this is not an installation about prostitution. This is an installation about the buying and selling of human beings in order to use them as slaves in a sexual workplace. So it's not about prostitution in that sense. I think that the larger argument, however, about why we still do this the oldest profession on earth, why we've never questioned that, why we don't actually sit down, men and women together, and say, what, what is this? Why do we do this? Because actually, it's the, you listen to the testimonials of the men who, um, who do buy sex from foreign prostitutes who they do not know or cannot speak English, do not question that. It's very interesting. The, the lev there, are, there is a great level of denial in some of them, but some of those testimonials are very sad and very understandable. Men whose wives have died of cancer who don't know how else to deal with their sexual needs. Um, clearly, we're not addressing that because sex and our real sexual needs are still taboo. We think that we had a sexual revolution. That's just nonsense. We understand sex so much less now, I think, than we <laughs> maybe did before when it was still hidden. It still had its mystery, and there was still a curtain across it. Behind there, people were probably being a little bit more honest than they are now. I suggest that there is an enormous debate to be had about our relationships with each other, our sexual relationships with each other. Um, this morning, we started to talk about the sexualization of imagery across the board and I noticed to my horror that now in London there are buses going round with a naked woman with two large 10p pieces covering her boobs. <laughs> what is that going same? on? We all have to write to Ken Lewis and say this is not to be allowed, not to be born. I am sorry, this is our city, we must take responsibility for these images. If a young girl who is not yet able to read the Sun 20p and make the connection between some idiot and this photograph, all she's going to see is a woman with two money pieces on her. What does that say? And she's naked. Ma female nudity and money, again, put together. Women can be bought. They can be bought. And that somehow, and you listen to the testimonials, that means that they are complicit because the, there is an economic thing going on and that makes it okay. So, we, Really, that advert on the side of the bus made me realise that we had not come on in any way, that we were, we're not having this discussion. So uh, I'll stop there because I think some, you might want to say something, do you? I was going to ask about whether you actually go to these women or whether they come to you. How does that relationship work? Well, the trafficked women who come to us are, usually, are people who, have in some way or other, escaped from the brothel or the sauna or the room where they have been kept. And it's complicated and it's dangerous. They will then perhaps have been, uh, or it may have been suggested to them by people trying to help them on their way that they should apply for asylum. Um, and people are often referred to us through um, a solicitor who is trying to help them in their uh, asylum case. It may be the Poppy Project, which is a home office project giving some form of housing and accommodation to some of the women. But it is, and I'm sure they will agree, it is too small a project to really attend to all the needs of the women. 25 places. Yes. So, but I mention it because they are doing a good job but they, 
they would like to do, I'm sure, very much better. Sometimes people are in detention, um, and we hear about them from many different ways once they're in maybe a removal detention in this country. Because once they have applied for asylum, they are not infrequently put into a detention center. That may be, uh, doesn't matter with the names. So um, they, they are brought to us or come to us in a number of different ways. Poppy Project, solicitors, friends who visit the detention centers. That means friends who organized people who, who actually visit the detention centers will tell us about the women who may be there. Um, of course, one of the most difficult situations then is to deal with fear because they are living in fear. They are in fear of being sent away. They're in fear that they may, their case will not be believed, which is often the case. And they are in fear also that somehow if they're sent back, the traffickers will find them again. Because the threat that the traffickers make is if you tell, we will kill you. If you do not comply, you will be beaten until you do. And that is the case, they are. And many of the women that we see have been really seriously damaged physically and psychologically. Um, they've been kicked in the head, they've been beaten to pulp almost. They are, some are scarred forever. But the scarring that is the most terrible, of course, is the psychological scarring. It's the humiliation. It's the loss of everything that they'd ever hoped for, the loss of their body, the loss of any kind of physical or psychological integrity and they are lost. And that's where we come in. So how do they come to us? Um, many different routes, but we are there, and believe you me, they do find us. Um, could you say a little bit more about the EU directive and whether we are resisting signing it or not? Certainly. <laughs> um, the European Convention Against the Trafficking of Human Beings is terribly, terribly important. Now, um, David Cameron was down on Monday and saying, yes, well, we're a little bit, you know, there are certain things. And I said, oh, what's that? Is that the pull? The problem that they identify governmentally, um, because it's, it's very much in the news and it's very much taken up by the newspapers, is what is called the pull, which means the possibility of bogus asylum seekers using this as a loophole in some way. Now, I had a big, long chat with the UK's top barrister in trafficking <coughs> yesterday about the convention. And for those of you who don't know what the convention is for, it is basically for, first of all, the protection of women who have been trafficked. Then it is for the prevention of further trafficking. And this is for the prosecution of traffickers. Because believe it or not, these women exist as criminals they are criminalized by their own misfortune because they've given over their passport and when they arrive here, there is nowhere for them to exactly. go. If a police go, policeman goes, and we've spoken to police who've done this, to the raid, there's 100 girls, none of them speak English, they're all weeping, there is nowhere for them to go except into a police cell or to a detention center. So how on earth are we going to address this problem? We need data and we need to give these women time so within the convention, there's the possibility of having three months, up to 30 days actually, first of all, of recuperation. Um, now, and a sense of safety. That's right, which is yes. Quite but what, what the issue is for the government is what if that's used in some way? Now, one of the countries that is absolutely what miles ahead of any other European country is Italy. Now, in Italy, they've had, they ratified it a long time ago, but not only did they ratify it, they actually put into, into process in their country their methods of monitoring and evaluating the effects of this period of of rest and what they what they saw was they weren't getting any more cases of 
bogus asylum seekers. What happened was they found they could very easily identify the people who were not actually, and not actually been trafficked, because of the fact that they ask and they require that those women engage with the services that they're being offered throughout that three months, with counselling, with um, a rehabilitation program that is on all kinds of levels. And they found that those women who did not come forward to engage with those processes were the ones who were not actually, had not actually experienced that trafficking. They were much more, they were much better equipped to identify those people who had actually been trafficked by having offered them the services that they so desperately needed. We don't have the capacity to do that at all in this country and it's terribly frustrating for the police and in fact the Met were the first people I went to I went, actually no I went to Ken Livingston and said can I have Trafalgar Square mm -hmm. that was the first thing to get a sight you know he said oh yeah it's not a photo so. and um, uh, what are you going to do with it he said <laughs> I don't know yet I'll think of something um, and um, the Met were great because they said you know what we need we desperately need these women to know that we don't regard them as criminals because that's mm. what they're told by their traffickers. The police, you must not trust the police. And of well, course... That they will, you will be really badly damaged by us if you do. A, that, yes. and B, if it's not by us, it'll be by them. Yes. And many of the women, on deep, upon deportation, because they're often deported in their whore's weeds, will arrive at their country of destination, their country of origin, and be raped by the police as soon as they get off the plane. Because they're wearing... This stuff, they're not allowed access to their own clothes. They're not given civilian clothes. They're deported in the, in the thongs. I mean, it's just extraordinary what we're doing. Does that kind of vaguely answer your question? Okay. I mean, these are y women, young women, who've never known protection of any kind, really. Many are without families. And certainly, if they ever do approach the police, they're often abused. Because in many countries, the police are, are implicated in the procedure. This gentleman here. Yes, um, I'd like to challenge the use of words here. Um, we're using the word slavery, and it seems to kind of water itself down from plantation slavery to trafficking in women to domestic abuse. Um, let's remember what plantation slavery was about. They're talking about hot pepper salt being sometimes rubbed into open wounds. Slaves were splashed with burning wax, and women's shameful parts were burnt with hot coals. And one master attacked his slave and bit off their flesh. Some were buried alive after being forced to dig at their own graves. One chef was thrown alive into the oven when the master was unhappy with the meal. And we're talking about people being worked to death over three years. Now, I have absolutely every sympathy and support for what you're doing, but to say it's the same in this year of the abolishing slave trade, of plantation slavery, I feel there's a certain violation taking place there. I don't think it really makes the situation better for you, but it does take away from myself and people like me when you blur That's these boundaries. That's very interesting. Um, can you, first of all, no one's said it's the same. We have described it always as a new kind of slavery, a new form of slavery. And I do not uh, think that anybody would take issue with the fact mm. that being forced into this kind of existence is not a form of slavery. Uh, so no one is, as it were, in a competition about how dreadful things can be for people. And, um, and I find that a little bit um, off-putting myself, as though, you know, it's like these people have suffered more those people who suffer come to us for help and we respond to that in the same way as Wilberforce responded to peculiar, peculiarly cruel forms of depraved forms of cruelty that existed in the early day, in the plantation slavery days. Um, it was a different era of slavery and um, goodness knows, and I know those stories very, very well, um, it was unspeakable. Um, and it was a holocaust and it was a genocide and it was all of those things. Um, I have a real problem when we take words and say this only can apply to this kind of suffering and this kind of suffering is worse than this kind of suffering. Yes. It's not good enough to do that. What is, what, all that we can do as human beings, as compassionate and responsible human beings is say this is suffering, this is a form of slavery, what are we going to do about it? I mean to, to 
forgive me, but use up time discussing whether you know something is worse than something else is seems odd to me when there is clearly such a need, such suffering, and personally as well. I mean, <laughs> the the fact of taking someone's body and giving it to be used in that way, day after day after day, it does, I think, actually come pretty high on my list of hell holes, mm -hmm. places I would really rather not be. Um, and and I, I, don't, I don't really see how anyone can sort of win this kind of argument. It's not something that I would wish to enter into as a sort of, to try and persuade you that this is as bad as, or worse than, or less bad. I don't think that's the point. The point so is, it's all. awful, it's another form of slavery, and we must act. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> and I think we've said rather little about the actual brutality and cruelty that amounts to torture that the women are subjected to in order to comply. And until they comply, they are, they are tortured. And of that, I have evidence. And that's the evidence that my organization is here to prove, just as it's here to prove other forms of ill treatment, cruelty, and torture in other areas of man's inhumanity, or everybody's inhumanity. I'd like to say just one thing here, though, um, that I have two cases where the, the man, on learning, on understanding from the woman who had broken down, which she was really not allowed to do, by the way, and could be punished for, understood something that he'd not understood before. And on both occasions, the people, the, the women were helped to escape by the, by the man. So I think we need to recognize that change is possible in, in most people. Mm. And that's really what our work is about. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, I think to extrapolate again from this, this exchange, um, when the anti-slavery people said, you know, look, you're looking at, you, these people have been treated as though they are less than, so they are subhuman. They are less than us somehow, which is the way in which uh, it's the only way in which you can persuade another human being to do that kind of thing. You've got to persuade them, as the Nazis did, and the, and the, in Rwanda, as, as happened. If you have, you know, ways of persuading that, persuading a human being that they can be brutal because this is not another human being. This is something less. That that all of this, all of this work, as we go towards a new century, as we start to build a new ethics for this century, is about respecting one another. Mm no matter what we've been through, as it were. Can um, I just come in there? Please do. Mind? I have seen genocidal suffering from a genocide. I have witnessed it. But it's the very witness of that suffering that I'm not comparing to another genocide or to another form of suffering. It is that suffering that makes me want to do what I'm doing today. It's not because I've seen something that you may say is greater or bigger or worse that is going to stop me. It's about a degree of suffering and, and, and something awful in our own society that needs to be put right. And we have to deal with all forms of cruelty and where I'm concerned, all kinds of suffering. Um, are there any reliable numbers, any figures of women currently trafficked in this country, and how do we compare with the rest of Europe? And are there reliable numbers? It's about 4,000 a year are trafficked. That's mm. the figure, I think, that we Worldwide, it's something akin to sort of 800,000, but we don't really have figures. I mean, it's such a hidden criminal industry. I mean, it's the biggest criminal industry after drugs and arms. And because it's clandestine, it's necessarily, obviously, very difficult to get reliable data. So the last conference I went to, they, they said, well, there's this, and they showed the maps with all the countries, the, the, the arrows of where people go and where people come from, and they gave numbers, but they said, you know, really, it's very difficult to, to tell. Are these girls um, 
mostly like economic refugees, or are they actually being abducted or kidnapped? Or They've been abducted and kidnapped and coerced over quite a long period. It's a very subtle process and extremely insidious. They are identified as vulnerable women by the trafficker. And it isn't just a question of they're suddenly taken. Very often, they are quietly seduced about. We, I know somebody who might be able to give you some accommodation for a little while, and they'll take them to a woman, very often, somewhere in the town, who will look after them, and then they will bring them one or two things, but very careful. They never overdo it. It's very subtle, very, very subtle. It can take six months. Sometimes it's a fiancé saying, I've heard I've got a great opportunity, let's go. And they'll go, and then the fiancé will take, take away the passport, put the girl to work, and that's it. It's family members, it's friends of the family, it's, it's oh, yes. terrifyingly close to home. That's We've the thing, it's not, it's not some guy in a black suit with a balaclava and a gun, you know, it's someone you know, as so often is the case with mm -hmm. violence and abuse against women and children across the board. Um, I have an observation and a question. The observation is the distress that many of us feel when we realise that other women are involved in the control of these people. Absolutely. And the second, um, I, I've heard you talk about your reaction and your assistance to those who come to you. Do you have room for any outreach work? Finding those who can't find their way to you because of fear or being brainwashed that they're okay? There are a lot of people who are helping us, who are out there. Not enough, never enough, but there are people out there who are looking out and are aware. And so we do get messages from various cities, not only in London, and we do see people, yes. But it's never enough. And um, a charity is never wealthy enough or strong enough or resourced enough to really um, do what they want to do. We do our best, and I think we do it very well. Well, that's why the legislation involved in the convention is so important, because that's where you're going to find your outreach, really. You know, we, when, when authorities are uh, in receipt of funds so they can properly train their interviewers, they can properly um, mm. have immigration persons who are able to identify people who've been trafficked easier because it is, we do lack information, we lack data. I mean, I've spoken to people in the UN about this and because we haven't got 10 countries ratify, ratifying this convention, the, the, the processes are not now put, the structures are not in place. We need to get them in place as soon as possible because then everyone's going to start talking to each other and we will be able to refer. And what Helen and Michael are hoping is that their methods of, of healing can be um, repeated and replicated in other places because that's terribly important as well. We're not, we don't deal well at the moment with, with it, generally speaking. No, but of course we do, we also do speak to the decision makers. Mm. We do make it our business to do that on the basis of our documentation. We do approach the decision makers. On this occasion, we've approached the public. And that's been very rewarding. What the children were talking about yesterday was we can prevent, we want to prevent. So it's about, in, it's about prevention and it's about um, being courageous and speaking out about a subject that some people will laugh about when they do. It's about empowering them to do that. And it's about, you know, they were so brave yesterday with their bits of paper running off to make a play in the school. But we can prevent was what one child said to me, quite a small boy, signing the petition with his left hand. <laughs> I think yeah. as well, um, the educational arm is, is, is hugely important. I mean, I often speak about um, firewalls, and the only firewall in this instance actually is no. 
I, 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 I'm not coming with you. I'm not going to give you my passport. No, because I know what you're up to. And actually, all these young people are chosen because of their innocence and because of their lack of access to information. So I would say that educationally, you can make yourselves incredibly useful because if you can make pieces of, of art or, or, or packs or anything and then become find a school in Albania, Lithuania, and twin with them because it's not as difficult as twinning with schools in Africa where you know computers and stuff aren't so readily available, you could actually get right into some of the countries of origin and transit and start exchanging information between young people because they are, they are the people who we need to reach.